Okay, so I'll tell you the story of our online master in computer science uh, program at Georgia Tech. Uh, we call it OMS OMSCS. OMSCS is Online Master of Science in Computer Science. The name reveals nothing. Distance learning existed from the 60s of the last century and then went online when the internet came about in the 90s. So nothing new in the name. Uh, it's collaboration among Georgia Tech, Udacity. Udacity provided the platform and AT&T. We'll see their role later. Uh, announced in May 13, started in January 2014, so the baby is not a baby anymore, is almost four and a half. Our motto is accessibility through affordability and technology. And our, our master program has three or four unique features. The first one is the price. Uh, the entire master degree costs $6,600. In, and you don't pay at once, you pay per course. And the typical master in public university is 40,000. In private university can exceed $70,000. So that's the first unique feature cause some, some kind of an earthquake when it was announced. Second one is the world's only accredited MOOC-based degree in computer science. That might change. Uh, Coursera announced that it's creating two new ones. And I think Anand men mentioned that also edX might have one. But we shall see. For now, it's the only one, and it's growing. Uh, where are we now? Uh, so far, 1234 uh, students graduated. Uh, enrollment in the last term was 63-65. Uh, by the way, in the fall, it's expected to be probably higher than 7,500. Uh, Harvard University research uh, claimed that, uh, and they claimed it when it was half the size, that OMSCS is the largest master program in computer science in the US probably, possibly the world. We don't know what's going on everywhere. Domestic international is slowly shifting. Right now, 30% international. So it's mostly domestic. American citizens or American permanent residents. So now it's 70% domestic. When we started, it was 87% domestic. We'll get to it a bit later also. What Question. Number one, why are we doing it? So there are about 20 reasons. Uh, reason number one, uh, Georgia Tech mo motto is progress and service. We believe it's progress and it's service. Uh, our college has history of innovation. I, we don't, that's another lecture. MS and CS are the natural places to start. Of course, PhD, the actually OMS CS students that want us to have online PhD, but we don't. So PhD, you need the presence, so at least most of the time. Undergraduates, certainly not to start with undergraduates. And master degree, kind of in, in the middle. And fortunately, many faculty don't care about master students, so we could do it. Uh, now is the right time. Now when we started was the right time. Uh, Georgia Tech was uh, in the second generation of the MOOC uh, revolution, you know, with Coursera, you know. So there was a zero generation, it was Stanford, and then there were four other universities, and then Georgia Tech was a, a quick joiner. And we, so far, we had about f 46 courses with Coursera and edX, and we have served 4.6 million students. And initially, uh, people like to do it, Studen students like to do it, and uh, so we had some experience and that also motivated us to do, to do the master degree. And I'll, I'll get, tell you exactly what happened next. That's a big reason. Students want credentials. The, the problem is the MOOC, the, usual, the large masses in the MOOCs don't get any credential. 
And that's, that causes that many of them drop, you know, single-digit survival. The, the minor difficulty in their life, they drop. Actually, many of them even don't start, you know. So you hear, oh, the MOOC had 150,000 students. The first class already had less than 70,000. You know, nobody downloaded the first class. So uh, uh, once they pay, they usually participate. Uh, and they want degrees. So there, there was uh, Sir Daniel, who was a vice chancellor, which is actually a president of the Open University in London, which, by the way, I think is the largest university. Uh, he gave a lecture on MOOCs a few years ago, and he basically said the following, that MOOCs without credentials is a second-class education to the unwashed masses. I wouldn't go that far, but that's what he said. But people really want credentials, especially degrees. Largest pool of prospective students, non-traditional, and actually many, many of our students are non-traditional, we'll see. A redefining learning experience. So, usually the naysayers, or all of them say, oh, online, not face-to-face, -face, cannot be good, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay? And in some respect, even, these courses, our courses are superior to the face-to-face cl -face cl uh, classes. You will see. Not in all respects. You know, if you have a small class of 30 students, of course, it's much, much better to be in the same room. But in many of the courses in the hot areas, and computer science is extremely hot, as you will see, uh, there the are classes of 300 students. Face-to-face -face means nothing. Address shortage in computing professionals. You'll see, it, it is acute. A new pipeline for PhD students. We already have two or three PhD students <laughs> that came from OMSCS. You see, in the usual application mode, we always lose to MIT, Berkeley, all those ranked higher than us, because most of the Chinese and Indians, they just look on the ranking and get to the highest ranked program that they can. But here, you can find gems, people that even didn't plan to do masters, and you find some, some fantastic people. Okay? And it already happened a very small number of times, but it happens and it's wonderful. So why are we doing it? Because we can and we should. So how did we get to, uh, to $6,600? Uh, the price uh, should match the cost to, to achieve scale. The goal was, of course, first and foremost, not to make money but uh, uh, to, to increase access. We were fortunate that AT&T gave us $2 million. That helped us get started right away, because you guys are involved with MOOCs, and you know that MOOCs are expensive. So in the beginning, MOOCs actually cost something of the order of 300 k uh, It's now the, the kind of MOOCs we do. And it's now under 200, 170 or something. So it's very, very expensive. So with the $2 million, we, could, we get start, could get started. And then by getting more and more students, they would pay for, 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 in, for growing the program. And it worked. And fixed costs don't scale. So making the course is very expensive. On, we usually don't remake them and changing them, tweaking them very inexpensive. And every once in a while, we redo a course. And we redid two of our 30 courses. We, 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 did it, we did them from scratch again. But how did it really start? So if you remember, 2012 was declared by the New York Times as the year of the MOOC. And in September, early September of 2012, Sebastian Tran, the founder of and CEO of Udacity came to visit me, and he said to me, Tzvi, let's do a master program for $1,000. And I'm pretty good with numbers, especially with a dollar sign. And I told him, 1,000 won't do it, maybe four. Eventually, our administration correctly pushed a bit higher because, you know, to play it safe. But remember, 2012, the year of the MOOCs, MOOCs were free, everything was free. Nobody thought about money. We still don't think about money, but 
then everybody did it for free, all the smokes, you know, and it looked like it will be that, like that forever. Of course, it's not sustainable. So efficiency of ex execution, so we, we learn how to do these courses cheaper, but still they're not cheap, okay? So Sebastian came to visit me. He said, let's do it. The question is how to do it. And that's the big questions that I'm asked again and again. How did you do it? You know, because that makes, that needs, I need a faculty. You know, I'm only the dean. I cannot tell the faculty tomorrow you do X. Except for two non-tenured faculty, they will laugh me out of the room. Okay? So, how did we do it? We created a working group, no, no administrators. I didn't participate. Uh, the leadership, we didn't participate, we didn't intervene. I told them, if you don't want to do it, we will not do it. But they cheated a little bit. And I created a committee from people that liked MOOCs. <laughs> Actually, initially, uh, they even didn't want anybody to be paid, but I don't believe in free work. So if you ask me later, I can tell you who is paid what. But uh, initially, so they were, and they deliberated for six and a half months and created a document and also created who will get what. And uh, AT&T gave us the $2 million dollars Two months, you know, th there was a vote, you know, 75%. That's also an amazing achievement. 75% of the, of, of the faculty voted to do it, okay? And, and, you know, change, that's why everybody asked me. Making a change in a university is almost impossible. Faculty, they can be the most liberal, progressive people in the world. Try to touch the benefits. Try to change their lives. No, no changes. Even if it's in their benefit, if even they are better off, they always success, suspect, and sometimes they're right, that there's something behind it. So they don't want to change anything. So, but they, 75% of them voted uh, to do it, but they did it in March. In January already, AT&T, uh, gave us a two million and expected in a week or two that we will move forward. Took another two months after four months of deliberation to, to de get the vote and to do it. Three main concerns, quality, 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 quality of the program, quality of the students, quality of the tests. Actually, the basic decision was to have the exact same quality of the on-campus course. And in fact, the diploma doesn't mention online. You know, it's a master program, master degree, master program, and justifiably so. Oh, I pressed something wrong. Oh. You need to bring it to. You need know, to. to to press the display. Okay. The leadership supported us. Maybe because they didn't fully understand what we were doing. Actually, we didn't understand either. Uh, and they intervened with the Board of Regents that approved it in May. And then, in another six months, we, created the we announced it in May, after the vote. And then, in eight months, we created the first five, first five courses and started going. Okay, okay, I, I will run it. So, I give you some current numbers. That's totals. Applications so far, we passed the 20,000 mark. That's total. A admission rate, 60%. That's the third unique feature. People will hear 60% admission rate? Are you crazy? Universities are ranked, you know, Admission process should be called rejection process. Stanford University accepts 6% of the students. 30 or 40 other percent are as good and some of them better. 
And who makes the decision, by the way? Admission officers. And who are these powerful people? 27 year old kids with a bachelor in comparative literature. They make the decision. Okay, and they take into account if you help an old lady cross the street, you get two points. If you did something social, you know, all sorts of, and they build the class in certain way, etc. So when I was Dean of Engineering at Columbia, uh, an alarm came to me and said, Svi, you know, you are idiots. I said, I know we are idiots, but different people give different reasons. So why? He said, you know, we, I have a super bright son. He was accepted to Cornell, which was higher ranked than Columbia Engineering, and you rejected him. I told him, no, I'm not surprised. It's a crapshoot. <laughs> it's a lottery. You know, it, it could be accepted and rejected anywhere. Okay, some of them with perfect SATs, you know, they're not accepted. So we accept, of course, because we don't have space limitations, everybody that we believe is capable. There are accept admissions requirements. If you ask me, I can detail them. One of them is to have a BA. It's an MA, it's MS, it has to, you have to have a BS. But there are several of them. Okay, but we accept everybody that we have strong beliefs that he can do it. Not, they cannot always do it. You'll see later. 149 countries and many people with many degrees. There are people with PhDs and masters in other areas. Because now com computer science, certain areas of computer science are needed anywhere, everywhere. So, so we have students with PhDs. We had some students of, with PhDs that dropped out, couldn't, couldn't do it. 73% were domestic. It's inverse of master's students in computer science. Uh, the master's students at Georgia Tech, 87% international. Question, why? The, the answer probably is that international students, mostly first in Georgia Tech, the Indians, second are the Chinese, they don't care about the master's degree, they want a visa. And that's, that's the price to, p to get into the US, okay? So the, the price won't deter them, they want to get in. So this shows that the two groups were different. They are, they are different in other respects. They are different. So we were not cannibalizing the on-campus program. It may in the future, so far it didn't. You will, we will see more numbers later. This is the enrollments. Before it was applications, here's the enrollments. Over 10,000 students so far. Total 10,000 students so far. 88% yield. So once they accepted, they come. Between 80 and 90%. Uh, as I said, 63, 65 enrolled. And the demographic, very interesting. First of all, they're older. Average age, 33. 11 years old, the normal master student starts at 22, immediately after bachelor, the usual ones on campus. 72% uh, US citizens or permanent residents, all states and less countries, but still over 100 countries represented. Some countries don't make it. Uh, and also advanced degrees, PhDs, MBAs, you name it. All, all the degrees, some f uh, we have students enrolled in the program. Again, okay. International enrollment, so just quickly over the numbers. So th this is India, China, and Co South Korea, 40, 30. And, and, and in OMSCS, yes, it's India, but much smaller percentages. China, and God bless Canada. A retention per semester, what does it mean? They start the course. As you see, what happened is 14% dropped during the course. They dropped the course. But then 9% of them came back in the next semester. So the real loss was 5%. It's not clear that it's the real loss because we look at the next semester, but some of them might have skipped the next semester. So, but it's very few of them. So, the loss is 5%, and I won't go over it again. We did it, the experiment with, an, with another semester again. Between 15 and 20 drop, 
And you know, it's, it's so cheap. You have a problem in the, pro in the family, you have a problem in your job. You see that you're not doing well, so you drop. <laughs> and so you paid one course, okay? Uh, retention per year, so we have already several years, so for, we looked at the first two years. Uh, the, first two e the first year, the first cohort was 380, but the first year, 2014, we had 1388, 33% graduated, 23 still in the program, so 44 dropped. Or skipped this semester. And uh, similar to 2015, 43% dropped. So survival rate is, is nearly 60%. So, you know, are all, these, these students are all there. They, they take this uh, degree, but then they see, hey, I don't have the time, I don't have the passion. I have problems, family, job, you know, so some of the, we lose 40%. In the on campus, we don't lose hardly anybody unless they have a mental breakdown or something. If all these Indians and Chinese, they come here, they finish. Though, I mentioned 60%, on campus we accept 10%. And they perform roughly the same as the online students, because sometimes we have the same course taught online and on campus. And we see how they perform in the, in the finals. And actually, in some cases, they are, the online even is slightly better, but it's not statistically significant. So it's comparable, comparable performance. So here, you know, 10, only 10% 10 were accepted. <laughs> and here, 60, and actually the last time, it's 70% because they're getting better for some reason. So it's, go it's going up. This is women and minorities. So ju just quickly, women in OMSCS, the percentage is higher. Why? Because of international. The escape from computer science by women was an American phenomenon. And I won't get into it now. So OMSCS is higher percentage of women. OMSCS. <laughs> Has a, I'm, yeah, minority, the minorities are higher also in OMSCS because, possibly, because minorities in general are less capable economically. So that attracts people that, that cannot pay the, the, the full price, but I'm not sure. The difference is not that high. So these are the 30 courses that he have done, two of them we read, three of them in machine learning. I have no time to get, I never get into the details. We have 30 courses. We have a few more that we want to make, just very few, like deep learning, like blockchain, like a couple more courses in cybersecurity. But basically, we are done. I'll show you a video of one or two minutes, and then I'll tell you what you, what you have seen. Hi, I'm a Mac. <laughs> no! All right, we'll start over. Let's do this right. So when I wrote these down, I started to think, boy, they're more different than you'd expect just by sticking an un in front. How so? Well, they don't seem to really, the definitions don't seem to have all that much in common. You know, it's not like this one uses label training data to generalize labels to new instances, and this one uses unlabeled training data to generalize labels to new instances. Like, I would think that you'd have the definition of one, you just stick an extra un in there. Well, that's kind of true, right? So you, if, if, you, if you do some data description and uh, make sense out of unlabeled data, and then I give you a new piece of data, somehow using that description, you would know how to describe it. Maybe. I mean, there's definitely some, some unsupervised learning algorithms that do some amount of generalization. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it's, it's, not as, it's not as unified. I think in, in, in some sense, the concern here is that unsupervised learning is just not as unified a problem or as well-defined or crisply defined a problem as supervised learning. Is. Oh, I think that's definitely true. Here's the game. You've got two people. These two people are criminals. Oh, no. Are they smooth criminals? One of them is. You're terrible. Okay. So we this is Charles Isbell. 
plus four. Ooh. <laughs> and I'm Michael Littman. Plus two. Wait, why am I worth less? Minus two. Stay on topic. All right, well, it's my job to introduce our mini course on reinforcement learning. Plus one? Hmm. Okay, what, what did I show you? A few things. Uh, first, you know, the writing, that's kind of udacity way of doing things, which is quite nice, you know, how, how to, not, PowerPoint, you know, terrible. <laughs> uh, second, uh, this, uh, we have only two courses with two lectures, <laughs> so they do it together. One of them is actually, if you notice, from Brown University, so uh, we, uh, uh, Michael Littman is from Brown and Charles is from Georgia Tech. And then they can play the good cup, the bad cup, the student and the teacher, and they can entertain, they can sing, they can do all of this, and they do. So just a, a small break to show you something live. Okay, this is the fourth unique or special thing about our program. The incredible amount of use of social networks, okay? Uh, Google, so for example, in Google Plus, there are more participants than students. I don't know who are the others. Maybe potential students, maybe dropouts, I, I don't know. There are more, and of course, Facebook, and uh, there are 66 groups on Google Plus self-generated by the students. So it's incredible. So there is a community, which is wonderful. That's one of the things that is missing if it's not face-to-face, -face. but they created a community, or several communities. So for example, this husband and wife, and by the way, T-shirts, edX, listen, the T-shirt is the best value for money. You, they, they cost $4, and they love you. This guy is an Indian, so, kept Indian officer that serves in the Himalaya. He sent, this, he sent this picture. Unfortunately, there is no Wi-Fi in the Himalaya, so he downloaded the course. So, so he won't fall behind. So some, some, you know, they love us. 93% recommend to a friend. 97 said it's good, great value. We'll skip this. Students, this, is, this guy is a captain in the U.S. Army, just uh, uh, was released, and he's doing now a PhD, and he gave a seminar to hundreds of students about transition from the military to civilian life. So we had six such seminars, one of them on entrepreneurship. We have students with startups. So they participate. So what did we learn? So we learned uh, quite a lot of things. The first two are the big ones. The first thing that we learned is there is a large unmet demand out there that was not satisfied. Okay, we kind of discovered, we stumbled into this large, you know, we, we didn't know what we are doing, you know. We couldn't call MIT, which we call Georgia Tech of the North, and ask them, what do you do when X, because MIT is not doing it. So there was nobody to call. So we just jumped into the water and learned to swim. So we discovered this large unmet demand. The second one, you, you cannot learn from what you don't try. So we have all the naysayers. Oh, you cannot do this. Oh, you, you can do computer science. And indeed, computer science is natural. It's easier. And the computer scientists are better with systems. So it's a good place to start. You cannot do area X. I say, no, 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 no. You try to do area X. Worst come to worst, you fail. You have to try and do it. And you will be surprised. And technology is only teenager. You know, the technology is still improving all the time. Students extremely engaged, unbelievably engaged, officially and unofficially, interacting via the self-created social media groups, providing sig significant peer support, and many students eager to serve as TAs. So some students, they're not in some, you know, some, some projects are group projects, 
but if not, they are not allowed to collaborate. But then, after they get the grade, some students explain to the other students wh why they were, the points were deducted. They help us. They help us also in other ways. So when there is an article in some blog or in some uh, online publication and there are all these comments, they try to denigrate us. Guess uh, we don't answer them. The students answer them. They blast them. They don't know what they're talking about. The, 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 co the quality is hard. The courses are hard. Very, very hard work. And, you know, I gave two lectures in, per in Paris and Toulouse last week. In one of them in Paris came a student, and they asked him, how many hours you, you spend on one course every week? 20. Between 20 and 30 hours. It's hard. I mentioned TAs. That's an unbelievable phenomenon. When we started, that was my biggest worry. How shall we get, if it scales, if it grows, we, we need TAs. On campus, we have a TA for every 25 students. Online, we have a TA for every 40 students. Where will we get the TAs? Especially that on campus also, enrollment is exploding. <laughs> so CS is now hot. We need many, many TAs for on campus. Where will we get them? So then two days later, I found a possible solution. And I said, we'll get TAs from the program. Somebody performs well, you know, some, some of us use undergraduate TAs, you know, they, they take the course and they're fantastic and, 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 and do well and we use them as TAs. So, from the program. But then uh, I, I woke up sweating in the middle of the next night and I said, you're an idiot. Why would they do it? These people have jobs, they have families. They get real salary and here you are paid by the hour. It's kind of ridiculous. But they surprised me. They do it. They love to do it. They love to give back. And more amazingly, some students, before they graduate, they say, hey, hey, can I TA also after I graduate? So for, we have over 100 TAs from the program. About 20 of them already graduated. <laughs> they, also learn, they claim they also learn a lot from all this interaction. So this interaction on social, you know, social media, the kids nowadays, they were born with Facebook. They were born with social media. But they don't use it for classes. <laughs> they don't use it for education. Here they use it a lot. Of course, they need it less because they are face to face. They can discuss things, but no. So here somebody has a question. Ten minutes later, somebody else answers. Half an hour later, somebody says, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about, and so forth. Of course, there are also office hours, and sometimes the TA intervene, or even the professor sometimes. We also need to learn that they need a, a better program guidance. We must develop online, online advising process and to set expectations. So that's always good, to set the expectations. And the degree program is not the courses. It's also the community, and they created the community. So, more or less, not difficult to create. Creating product that is good, a good course, no problem. Was never a problem. You know, there are some superb teachers, and there are some very good teachers, and some lousy teachers. The lousy teachers we don't take for the program. But uh, uh, they do a really good job. Scalability, day-to-day -day kind of advising to ask questions, easy. We have one advisor for every... 1,500 students. Why? Students themselves help one another. You know, when is the exam? When is the deadline? All these, you know, all these questions. That's easy. Intentional grading, that's a challenge. Here we need them. You know, some automatic grading exists, and you'll see in a few minutes an example. Uh, but, uh, but usually you need real graders because you want also partial credit. I don't know if an AI program that can give partial credit. You got the wrong answer, but you did everything right, or something like that. I'm not sure that uh, somebody, maybe your company will do it. So, <laughs> intentional advising, the more serious advising, uh, you need people. Technology is good, but not perfect, but it's improving all the time. Uh, especially for community support, for test taking, and for projects. We learned that course discussions are not just possible, they're frequent. They have a lot of it. So here is a story of a TA uh, that was a bot. 
or a program, AITA. Her name was Jill Watson because she was named after Watson, the computer that IBM built, the program that beat the two world champions in Jeopardy, you know. So, but, but Watson does many other things. So there was this program that was, there was a TA, Jill, and she was in an AI course. Uh, and we anticipated 4%, but it went up. She answered many, many questions correctly. And two funny things happened at the end of the course. One, one of the students nominated her for the best TA award. Another was that another student offered to date her. A, on the other hand, somewhere in the middle of the course, one of the students wrote in the discussions, you know, Jill, I don't think she is human. She has no feeling. Something is wrong here. But then two people answered, what about the other TAs? There were more than 100 news stories uh, all over the world about Jill. Online students have control. Forum-based classroom puts students in the driver's seat. Some of them were qualified. You know, some of them are computer professionals. One of them will say, hey, what the TA said doesn't make sense, doesn't work in practice. They can do it. You know, so, they give, so classes are richer, richer than on campus, because you have all these mini experts all over the place that participate. And that also improves the class. And there are two anecdotes. We have a course in educational technology. It has teachers in it. We have a course in health informatics. It includes physicians. And they participate. So Harvard did a study about us. Harvard, two Harvard researchers and a Georgia Tech researcher. First of all, they discovered what I said already. The vast majority of OMS students would not pursue advanced degree if not for this program. And that's what they tell me. They thank me and said, without it, I would not take, do a master degree in computer science. I had no way, you know. I live far from university, have a family, I would move. Easy. They say that it is the first rigorous evidence that we know of showing online degree program can increase educational attainment. So there was online, but they pay the same, the same tuition that they pay on, the, on campus. Actually, they were charged, they had a sealed charge for technology. <laughs> so they paid over more. <laughs> than, so as a result, there were not many. In the past, they had many students because the industry was funding them. But the industry is not as rich as it used to be, and it's much, much more competitive. And AT&T was broken, and other companies were broken, and there are no monopolies, and they cannot spend this kind of money. They cannot pay, spend, for many students, $60,000 or $70,000. It, it becomes a big price tag. As I said, it's the largest in the US, and, and they computed that in a steady state, our program every year will create at least 7% of the master graduates in computer science. And you know, with the new numbers, this number is not 7%, it's 14 to 15%. So just imagine, one out of eight graduates in America, um, American graduate in computer science in master, with a master degree comes from our program, where there are hundreds of master programs in computer science. One of eight students. So very, very quickly about JAWS, we, we give them career fair, we give them virtual career fairs, uh, career counseling, and surprise, OMSCS students sometimes hire other OMSCS students. They use these charts as interviews, you know, so eventually they, keep, they get to know them very well and they hire them. There are such cases. Uh, by the way, that's how hot is computer science. Brown is the number of jobs. So in computer science, many more than double the jobs of the number of graduates. Even in engineering, there are less jobs than graduates. Now, social sciences, psychology is a disaster area. You know, so there are very, very few jobs. Even more so, 
Right now, 71% of all the new jobs, computer science, only 8% of the graduates are in computer science. And in the next five years, 74% of the jobs will be in computing and only 16% of the entire engineering. So computer science is hot, and that's a good, another good reason that, that we could start and grow it that fast. In other areas, you know, every area needs to be examined uh, carefully. What about impact on campus? Our number of applications since OMSCS on campus doubled, <laughs> more than doubled. Actually, that's without this year, it's 120 percent now. Also, undergraduates, more than five times, more than five, 400, and, and since 2008, more than 10 times, <laughs> more than 11 times. So, it, it's possible that OMSCS helped the brand of Georgia Tech. More people know that Georgia Tech exists. If you go all over the world, I'm not sure how many know about Georgia Tech, but now, a few more. Oh, again. This is another amazing story. There was a student who was doing his class and he Googled. Now, something really scary. If you Google something, Google is watching. They know everything about you. So he got a message to his screen and they told him, hey, you are, looking, you are talking our language. Do you want some challenges? For the next five days, he got quizzes and he answered. After five days, they offered him a job. In three months, he moved to Mountain View and had a job with Google. What I am most proud of, he still had three courses to do in OMSCS and he finished them. This also had more than 100 stories in the art and seven, in seven, at least 17 languages. This guy used to work for us, okay? So in, before, after we announced, before we started, I guess his speechwriter read in the New York Times about us. So he, gave, he talked about us in a number of his speeches. And two years later, he came to Georgia Tech, and one of the three reasons he gave uh, was, the first one was OMSCS. You know, we expected that in January 2017, when he steps down, maybe he'll work for us full time, but just heard that Netflix beat us. <laughs> So how do you measure success? Courses of high quality, check. Identical online and on campus assessment, check. Enrollment scales, moderately scales, check. Financial viability, check. This part, we have anecdotal. How does it impact hiring? We don't know. We have anecdotal, there are people that were promoted. There are people that were not in computer science. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to be a computer science student to get into the program. You need to know some, program, know some programming and to have some basics that you need. But you don't need to have a, a computer science degree. And we have some people. And we have people that used it, uh, like you wrote in one of the items, to change careers or to learn something new. Uh, but we. The Harvard people now are doing a new research about impact on, on uh, employment. It's a little complicated because many people have employment. And actually, in your slide, uh, some of them actually liked where they are. They, they, they actually did not like to change, did it for changing, they just did it for the sake of learning, which is also nice. Follow. So I include also. <laughs> Uh, MicroMasters as followers because they enter the, the credit part, you know. But they're not real followers. The others, there are about 10 followers now. Three in Illinois. So they, they are followers. That's also a good sign of success. Uh, they are not as low tuition as us. But they are like, we are one sixth of the tuition. They are less than half. Uh, Coursera just announced five, and among them some CS, but we shall see. I don't, I don't, I don't think they exist already. Uh, and uh, Georgia Tech has another one. That one is edX, is a, a analytics. A, and also cybersecurity, we hope to start also with edX uh, in January. 
So it, it, Georgia Tech will have three such uh, master programs. Okay, we don't know all the answers. We never knew. Uh, this is totally uncharted territory. So we, we, we learn the answers by doing. Again, I am. We have multiple research projects, including the minorities and women, how to uh, increase them, but other areas too. Uh, about cheating, uh, uh, if you want, you can ask me about cheating. Everybody's worried uh, about cheating, but there, there's, there are some good answers about it. Uh, so we have uh, multiple uh, research projects, which, which we actually fund. Overwhelming reaction. This was totally unexpected. Overwhelming reaction. You know, this is talk number 55 that I give, and I have six more this year. Uh, in 2017, we, OMSCS had three singular achievements. An increasing level of rarity. OMSCS won the national award or prize of UPSEA. UPSEA is University Professional and Continuing Education Association. So you won the national prize. So every year there might be another university. Second is the company is called Fast Company. They publish magazine and they publish on a website every year the list of the most innovative companies in the world. So far there have been three University, you ask me what company? I don't know, but three universities were on the list. Two of them in robotics, and only one in education. It's Georgia Tech, that was in 2017. The innovation was OMSCS. And the third one, which I think is even more amazing, is over a thousand stories in the media. We stopped counting a thousand. A one a seven minute segment in PBS NewsHour, nine in the New York Times, nine in The Economist, 15 in Wall Street Journal, 49 in the combination of inside higher ed and chronicle of higher ed. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Today there was another one. You know, four and a half years old, you know. In, in April there were four or five. They keep coming. It's tremendous opportunity to offer advanced CS yes, training in regions that lack quality options. And the, always the question of grading, student support, and advising. How do you scale? And where is it all going? So we are going with it to undergraduate education. S start, you know. So first of all, not in full. I don't believe in fully online undergraduate education. College has several purposes, three or four, other than the courses, okay? And I won't go through them. You know them, okay? But at least part can be online. And there are several reasons you want to have them online. So we started in spring of 2017, and we've done it already four times, spring, summer, fall, this spring. Uh, CS1301, in short, CS1, it's introduction to computing with Python. Uh, the teacher was a, a, a superb teacher from OMSCS. He also wrote with McGraw Hill a smart book, adaptive book, which is like MOOC with quizzes, which tests you if you understood the concept before you move on. So it's kind of duplication, but, but like, like every textbook for a course, it's a duplication. And to, for some people, it's very, very useful. Some people even don't look at it. The first, the first semester we had only 50. We also had a MOOC version through edX. The four credit uh, in the spring, we had four, 440 residential students uh, took it uh, online. And, and a thousand took, it, took the traditional course. That's the total for the four semesters. So it's about, now the last semester was 35% from the on-campus students prefer to take it online. Uh, no statistical difference in the learning outcomes. Feedback uh, from online students, amazing. 94 said it's equal, and they were not on, you know, this is intro course, but some of them are in other areas, so they've been in Georgia Tech for a year or two or three. So they took several courses. 94% said, 
it's as good or better than any course that you can show the tech. 81% said better, and one student sent me email, he said, this is the best course I took, I ever taken. So, a little, I cheated a little bit, because journal is fantastic, you know. Not every teacher is a fantastic teacher. In the book version, currently on 70,000, Paid, you know, for some certificate, it's only 500. Active learning, 1,400, 2%. So these huge numbers don't mean much with MOOCs. Prior education, some with high school or less, some with advanced degree, 21% female, which is okay, not great. Uh, 196 countries. The United Nations, I think, has 194, so pretty good. So here is, I have a vision, I have a dream. Maybe it's a, it's a delusion or hallucination. It's, can MOOC put a dent in the college cost? And I say they can. How quickly we'll get there? So unlike Sebastian, I will not say in five years, you know. I don't know. There is always pushback. Many faculty don't like this phenomena, phenomenon at all because they suspect somewhat correctly that eventually we'll need less teachers, less professors. As you'll see in my last slide, that's not true in computer science, at least for in the near future. Uh, so how can it do it? So intro courses, we can take like CS1, we now, next year we'll develop CS2 and 3, and possibly we'll create with edX a micro bachelor. So Anand coined the term, is Anand here? Here, good, check. So, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, this, this micro bachelor can be to college students, to college students in other universities that don't have enough teachers, uh, to high school students, to do it in high school. So, they can do it in high school, the, the early ones. So, they can do it. Uh, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then come and get, have the credit when they come to Georgia Tech, possibly to other universities. In the middle, our students, by the way, at Georgia Tech, you say finish in four years, only 40% of the students finish four years. 60% in five, 83% in one minute, five. I'm almost there. 83% finish in six, and the rest in more or don't finish. Uh, why? Because they have co-op and internship. internship. Easy. They, right now, they disappear for a semester or a year, don't like, study anything. Now they can, do, or in the summer, they have internship. They can take courses. And the last one, the advanced courses, OMSCS. OMSCS courses, because ju juniors, but mostly seniors, take master courses also, as part of the degree. So all in all, together, it shortens the time on campus and can make a dent, will not solve the problem, but 25, 30% of the problem uh, uh, can make the, the tuition cheaper, the total tuition. It all mid adds to, mini, uh, to, to reduction in the cost. That's my dream. So the last, I said, there is no, need, there is no problem because there is huge shortage in computer science faculty. Uh, and uh, there was an article last week but it referred to a, a, a committee of the national academies about the situation, which is dire. Because why? Serious, you know, so you see the blue is the number of students, and, and that's down there is the number of faculty. <laughs> that it's, uh, uh, why is it so? So we're graduating about uh, under 2,000 PhDs in computer science a year, but only 18% <laughs> goes to universities. We have Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Amazon, Microsoft, and they pay double and triple, okay? No, I'm one weirdo. I believe university job is the best in the world, okay? But, and there's some people like me. But, you know, if, if they pay you double or triple, so we see only 18% of them. So we see 300. <laughs> we see only 300 of them. There are over 1,500 schools. <laughs> So if, if everything was fair and equal, every university would be able to hire every five years because you, you have 300 versus 1,500, okay? 
Many universities cannot hire. There were demonstrations. Guess where? In Princeton. In Duke. Students couldn't get into the courses. Okay, they don't have enough faculty. Even in such universities, there were demonstrations. So, so what's the solution? Leverage online. Thank you.